This is a podcast by Wellhouse Church, where personal spiritual growth is fueled through a variety of practices rather than a single prescriptive time of devotion, where we discuss different spiritual practices that help us be more present with God, others, and ourselves. What's going on, practitioners? How's everybody doing? Um, hope you are doing well. So, we started talking about Making All Things New by Henry Nowen mm-hmm. um, last week. And just as kind of a refresher, this first chapter is kind of split up into the idea of being filled yet also unfilled. And we talked about being filled last week. Yep. Um, so let's talk about being or not being filled, being unfilled. Um, well, before we even do that, I, I want to just ask you a question. Now, it's, so, it's it's not super helpful because you haven't, you didn't, you weren't asked this question before you read the book, or at least this part of the book. I first got introduced to this book, and I didn't remember it until I picked it up to refresh myself on it um, earlier last night, something, and I was introduced to this book in a class. Mm -hmm. And so before we started reading the book, we were just asked before we were even told anything, like we were just asked, do you feel filled or unfilled? Mm. And then the professor was like, if, if you're comfortable, I want to know like by show of hands, how many of you are filled and explained a very Henry way of thinking about filled and unfilled. Mm hmm. And this is a room full of pastors, church leaders, and students of theology. Yeah. It's a seminary class. Like maybe 20% of the people in the room. Mm. Then the question was asked, how many of you feel busy and unfilled? Every single person in the room. This is a major problem that Henry's dealing with. Yeah. Huh. Huh. I'm glad that you told that story. Um, it does kind of set it up pretty well. So, he opens with this statement, Beneath our worrying lives, however, something else is going on. While our minds and hearts are filled with many things, and we wonder how we can live up to the expectations imposed upon us by ourselves and others, uh, we have a deep sense of, of unfulfillment. Um, I know that I do this. I, I set expectations for myself, um, that are way beyond what normal people would deem sufficient. Yeah. Um, my, my coach, Sean Palmer says this best. My, my morning writes checks that my afternoon can't cash. Yep. Um, yep. Like I, like I have an expectation for myself that it's just impossible for me to get done. And what it leaves you with is this always kind of wanting more, mm-hmm. right? I can do better. I can be better. So I will be better. Yep. This constant state of unfulfillment, right? Yeah. And for me... Mine didn't even start out that way. I started, I'm an Enneagram three, right? So if you know anything about the Enneagram, there's a, a figure in you li- in your life that from an early age, you feel like you have to perform for. Right. I think my stuff started from that place, but it's changed. Yeah. I, that's not the incessant need now. The incessant need, it's, it's me against me. Right. I, I have expect- I want to outperform myself. I yeah. I yeah, I get that. I am living a life that I have high expectations for myself. And so yeah. it it can stem from a lot of different places how you get to this place. Um and Henry talks about um different sentiments of unfulfillment um yeah there are three of them boredom 
resentment, and depression. Yep. Boredom is a sentiment of disconnectedness. While we are busy with many things, we wonder if what we do makes any real difference. You ever ask that question sometimes? Sometimes. I, it's less because of the work that mm. we naturally do. Right. Um, but even still, sometimes, I mean, like sometimes we put out a lot of content. We put out so much content. But actually our listener relationship and engagement isn't where I want it to be. No. And so, yeah, I'm grateful to put out content, but like yeah. one of our values is relationships. Like we want to meet and build community here. Um, and because of that, and that's one of our values, like sometimes I go, are we even making a difference? Right. Cause like content's not making a ton of difference for people. Yeah. Relationships and transformation yield that's mega right. differences for people. And so, um, yeah, sometimes I ask that question. Mm. I think it's less than most people because we naturally do content and faith-based stuff, but right. I still ask that question. I find myself asking that question a lot. Um, and <clears throat> he kind of talks about how, oh shoot, um, this boredom, um, Life presents itself as a random and unconnected series of activities and events over which we have little or no control. To be bored, therefore, does not mean that we have nothing to do, but that we question the value of the things we are so busy doing. Right? Yep. Um, the great paradox of our time is that many of us are busy and bored at the same time. That That's one of his greatest lines in the book. Mm -hmm. The great paradox is that we are both busy and bored. And it's because we're busy doing things that don't always necessarily yield right. life. I got to work. I got to cut the grass. I got to take the kids to soccer. Yep. I've got all these chores that I have to do. And we fill our lives with all this busyness that we forget to care for ourselves and do yeah. the things that bring us joy. We are full yet empty, right? Um, or we are busy and yet unfilled. Yeah. I mean, um, it, it really is. I, I think that's one of his greatest lines in the book. It's the paradox is that we are busy yeah. and bored. In short, while our lives are full, we feel unfilled, right? Yeah, a hundred percent. The That's, calendar is full, and yet I feel empty. Yeah. Um, but he also says that the boredom is closely linked to the resentment. Um, when we are busy, yet wondering if our busyness means anything to anyone, we easily feel used, manipulated, and exploited. Um. And he talks about how, in the beginning, this level of resentment is extremely powerful. Yeah. Right? And it's kind of like a hot rage. Yeah. But over time, it kind of becomes this frozen anger, is what he calls it. Yeah. Um, and this resentment that we carry towards being bored or yet unfilled... Um, is toxic to our current society. Yeah. Um, so, so then he moves on to um, depression. And he says that this is the most debilitating expression yep. of um, the sentiments of being unfilled. Yep. And he says this here. When we begin to feel... Not only that our presence makes little difference, but also that our absence might be preferred. We can easily be engulfed by an overwhelming sense of guilt. This guilt is not connected to with any particular action, but with life itself. We feel guilty being alive. Yeah. I'm not making a difference. Yep. I am not actively involved in the things that I should be actively involved in. I'm wasting space here on this earth. Well, and you know, you made the comment earlier 
about um, boredom being connect or being linked to be feeling disconnected. Mm-hmm. I actually think they're all expressions of disconnectedness. Oh, for sure. Um, including this one. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's I'm I'm disconnected from the world. I'm disconnected from value. I'm disconnected from identity. I'm I'm disconnected from all the things that make me want to get up in the morning. Yeah. Agreed. Um, yeah. Agreed. He actually says this here. Boredom, resentment, and depression are all sentiments of disconnectedness. Yeah. Exa- yeah um, exactly what Like exactly what you just said. Um, and he says here, in interpersonal relations, this disconnectedness is experienced as loneliness. This this um, is big. This is a big section. This is. Um, he says here, loneliness is without doubt one of the most widespread diseases of our time. Think it about is. it. We spend our lives, or at least on this side of the pond, we spend our lives working, 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 working. Yep. And what did we talk about? Um... Two weeks ago. Yes. No, last week. Um, your busyness affects your relationships. Oh, yeah. 100%. Um, which leads to levels of unfulfillment. Yeah. Right? That level of boredom um, or the depression that comes in and sometimes even resentment on the part of the other person you are in relationship with. Yeah. Um, Well, and for me, like loneliness is something that is like a new feeling for me. Um, So I lived at home Mm -hmm. with people around somebody around all the time. And then the first time I moved out, I had a roommate who, when we lived together, really didn't work. And so he was kind of always there. So I never really felt lonely. And then I lived by myself for about four months and I felt really lonely. Yeah. Like always being by yourself. I didn't, I was living out of state. I didn't really have a ton of friends. And so it was kind of a weird experience. Yeah. And then I moved home and. Yeah. Was kind of alone, but not really. And then I got married shortly after. And then we had kids. Right. And so I I was never alone. Like loneliness is not something I've ever felt before Mm -hmm. until my recent divorce. Like now I only have my kids 50% of the time. And... I'm not dating or, you know, I don't have my wife around anymore. So like I, like more than half the time I'm, or about half the time I'm alone. Yeah. Like there's literally no one in the house with me. Um, yeah. Why do you think that I spend so much time over here? Yeah. Because we're both lonely. We're both lonely. Um, loneliness is, uh, um, I think Killer. it's an epidemic. I think he um, actually makes a similar comment. He says widespread disease. Yeah. Um, lack of relationship impeding on your restoration. Yeah, I think so. Um, that's what he's talking about here. A hundred percent. And that's the spiritual discipline of spiritual friendship, right? And the imp- importance of spiritual friendship. Well, and I think also rest, Oh, I think part like of that literally too. Sabbath, yeah. like carving yeah. out time to do things that bring you life, right? Um, With other people that are life giving to be around. Well, I think that's part I, of it. I think that's what we're talking about here is loneliness, right? Correct. That's what we're talking about here. But we're also talking about busyness. Sure. And sometimes when you're constantly busy and with people all the time, sometimes you just need sometimes a moment need by your alone. But I think by yourself, and, and I agree with that. But I think where this conversation naturally leads is right here, which is why I was focusing on the relationship part. 
we can take a lot of physical and even mental pain when we know that it truly makes us a part of the life we live together in this world. Share the baggage. Yeah. Um, when you have spiritual friendship and um, you are being filled in that way, um, there's somebody there to help you with the baggage. Yeah. What is, what is that episode from How I Met Your Mother where everybody's carrying the bags? You remember? Um, oh. It's the chick... It's the episode where um, Ted's dating that girl when the wedding bride comes out and they go see it together. Oh, and it's all the baggage. Yeah, yeah. all the baggage. You I remember? can't remember the name of the episode. I but think it's called Baggage it or We baggage, All Have Baggage. Something like that. Oh, no, it's called The Wedding Bride. Yes. Yeah, it's called um, The Wedding it's Bride. It's called The Wedding Bride. Um, and at the end of the episode, after Ted's just really vulnerable and tells his story about the wedding bride and, and all that stuff. Um, there's a big chest that pops up in between him and this girl and on it is written left at the altar. Yeah. That's his baggage. That's his baggage. And she says, let me help you with that. Yeah. And they pick it up and they walk off with it together. Not the way that that episode yeah, ends. That it's episode the- ends, <laughs> and this all kind of blows. Clayton's metaphor really breaks down in this at, one. At, at that point, yes, it does. But all metaphors break down at some point. True. Um, but in spiritual friendship, you can help each other carry your bags. Yeah. Um, and I think that that is one of the most beautiful things about spiritual friendship. Agreed. And if you're listening to this going, hey, I don't really have spiritual friendship, reach out to us. Yeah. This is this is literally one of the reasons that we exist. You know, yeah. we do all of this content, but we're a network of house churches. We want to put house churches in areas so that you can have these relationships. We want we want you to find this level of spiritual friendship and community. Yeah. Um, and so reach out to us. If we don't have a gathering near you, we can maybe start one and help you get connected to other people and yeah. and those kinds of things. So don't don't think that there's no resource or avenue for you to find spiritual friendship if you don't have that kind of wholesome community that we're talking about. Yeah. We we can be a resource for you in finding that. Absolutely agreed. I mean, and that that's true for anyone. Yes. And we have a massive audience in India, we have a very large audience in the UK, we have an audience in Canada, we have our largest audience is obviously here in the U S which is where we're based. But I mean, we, we can hopefully try to facilitate this anywhere in the world. Yeah. Who makes this comment? Um, at this point when you are so unfilled and you're lonely, you end up kind of just coasting through life. You right. go on autopilot. You go on autopilot and you end up coasting through life. And he makes this comment. When we think of ourselves as passive bystanders who have no contribution to make to the story of life, our pains are no longer growing pains and our struggles no longer offer new life. Because then we have a sense that our lives die out behind us and do not lead us anywhere. Mm. Um, and he says this here, the past no longer carries us to the future. It simply leaves us worried about any promise that things will be different. Mm. Dang. <laughs> um, mm. for me as a six, that hits hard. Yeah. Um, because I think back on the past and where things have gone wrong where I've done or said something stupid and it makes me want to put my life on autopilot. Yeah. Um, and this level of like almost forcing unfulfillment on myself to not fail or something, or not be looked down on. Does that make sense? You get that? 
Yeah. Well, and I think part of it, 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 it says something great about the rest of his metaphor, but it's mm-hmm. that surely if I feel this full and yet unfulfilled, there's no place else I can dump this. Yeah. And so I've got to carry it, mm-hmm. which just further fills my capacity, making it a lack of capacity to go for fulfillment. Yeah. And so as you do that, yeah, I mean, it, it makes perfect sense that you want to go on autopilot because you're like, I, I don't have anywhere to park this because I'm yeah. lonely, resentful, I'm depressed, I'm bored. I'm all these things we've talked about. I, I got all this stuff going on in life, and I got nowhere I can dump this off to refill, yeah. which is why you need these relationships and you need these times of rest and you need all these things that make rhythms of life healthy. That's right. You need a rule of life. A hundred percent. So Henry says this to end the chapter. Jesus responds to this condition of being filled yet unfilled, very busy yet unconnected, all over the place yet never at home. He wants to bring us to the place where we can belong, but his call to to live a spiritual life can only be heard when we are willingly, honestly, Uh, willing honestly to confess our own homeless and worrying existence and recognize its fragmenting effect on our daily life. Mm 